Okay, so how to start this long ass video essay? I guess first let me lay out my biases, my credentials, and why I wanted to make this video. If you're here just to shit on Bumblebee, gaze, or call me an SJW because you can't actually compose a counter argument, then go off, I guess. Don't exert yourself too much. So who the hell am I to be talking about such an often heated topic? Well, I'm an upper class honorary graduate of film and television from university and work in digital content production full time. For my final year dissertation, a year's worth of research, I examined LGBT representation in animation with a particular focus on American television. Basically, any representation there's been, even the most subtle stuff from the 1950s when gays were a really big legal no-no, I've read about to some degree. I guess that makes me somewhat qualified to talk about this subject. So why am I doing this, you ask? Well, if you haven't noticed, there hasn't exactly been a counter-narrative or alternative voice on Bumblebee in the show, especially here on lovely YouTube. I would like to hopefully provide a viable one. My goal here really isn't to convince you, to convert you to waspism. But if you come away from this with a little more understanding and compassion, I guess that's okay by me. Speaking of bi's, I just want to clarify from the outset of this video that bisexuals exist. I speak for myself on that one, as a gal that happens to swing both ways. Guess you could say I'm biased. God damn it, Barb! So strap in. Damn, that's a perfect opportunity for a nice sexual lesbian joke I'm trying so hard to avoid. We're going to go through a lot of different talking points and topics in this video, and some of the videos and things I reference will be in the description should you want to check them out for yourself. Alright. So let's start way back at the beginning of Ruby. The original trailers told us bits and pieces about their characters. Nothing concrete, but enough of a springboard to tease the audience into wanting more in the show proper. Music also plays a big part in Ruby, and as far as I'm concerned, any piece of music that is featured in the show, not just on the soundtrack, is part of the show's canon, even if the story each song tells doesn't come to fruition for many years after it's featured. See Boop from the Volume 2 soundtrack. This, unfortunately, takes Bumblebee out of the show's canon-compliant songs. I love you, love Letter to a Bike, I truly do, you beautiful bastard, but you've got to take one for the team. So, back to the songs. Red Like Roses Part 1 from the Red trailer. Black the Beast, a fairly obvious reference to Blake and Beauty and the Beast. Blake fits both sides of that coin with her faunus heritage and her similarities to Belle from the original tale, with her love of books and her surname of course, Belladonna. Notice that although Yang's character design takes influence from Goldilocks and the Three Bears, the first description we hear of Yang in the show's canon doesn't reference this at all, instead referring to her as Yellow Beauty. This ties Blake and Yang's characters together from the get-go, with both of their characters alluding to the titular characters of Beauty and the Beast, both able to play either role. Neither are constrained to one or the other. Whilst Adam Torres, represented by the symbol of the rose on his back, plays the part of the curse from the original fairy tale that ultimately brings Beauty and the Beast together. Now let's look at character design. Costume and character design is everything in Ruby, and tells us a great deal about the characters through some lovely visual storytelling. 
For Ruby, we've got the obvious similarities to her mother's outfit, meant to visually indicate the similarities the two share to the audience, which of course turns out to be inherited silver eyes, as well as showing that Ruby holds Summer very close in her heart, despite being very young when she left her. For Weiss, the red in her collar presents a very obvious contrast against the white hues of the rest of her outfit, symbolic of her internal rebellion against her father, and Weiss's alignment with Nicholas Schnee, who also wore red around his neck. For Blake, her outfit takes significant influence from the colours both of her parents wear, but what I really want to focus on with Blake and with Yang are their eyes. Yang's lilac eyes and Blake's amber eyes are visually pretty striking, with Blake having hues of purple in her outfit and Yang with gold and oranges. The biggest thing for me though is this very deliberate choice in eye colour. Their eyes match each other's aura colours almost perfectly, and as we know from good old Pira, Aura is the manifestation of our soul. It bears our burdens and shields our hearts. This is an especially interesting creative choice when we look at a very early bit of concept art for Blake, where she had heterochromic eyes, something that was likely changed later in the development of the show to add to Blake and Yang's visual matches. Alright, now that we've got the basics in and laid down, time to delve into the show proper to examine the relationship between Yang and Blake from volumes 1 to 6. In particular, I'll be looking at the use of romantic coding and how this parallels with other romantic pairings in the show. So with Volume 1, there's really not a whole lot to talk about in terms of Blake and Yang development. In fact, Yang doesn't really get much chance to shine in this volume at all. She's very much a bystander to what little plot there is in this volume, and lacks a lot of the depth Volume 2 will give her. We do hear her sympathies for the plight of the Faunus, and she does attempt to make a connection with Blake when the two first meet, to little avail. I guess we really can't talk about this scene without mentioning Yang's comments about the boys sharing the room with him for the night. It's something I see commentators bring up an awful lot. I don't think Dad would approve of all the boys, though. I know I do. <laughs> As I said before, Yang really didn't have much of a character in Volume 1, and this line often comes across to me as joking, a throwaway line rather than anything super serious. So throwaway a line it was that the Japanese version of this episode removed it altogether. I mean, just look at the way she looks at Blake right after saying it. That girl. You know her? I'm not saying that Yang doesn't have any romantic attraction to boys. She's perfectly welcome to. But arguing that this line, literally the only part of the show's canon that suggests she does, makes Yang Xiaolong straight as an arrow is a big reach. She could be bisexual. She could be a lesbian. Plenty of lesbian women have had relationships with men before coming to that conclusion. It honestly doesn't matter all that much to me, but to pretend that this four second clip puts the nail in the coffin of Yang being anything other than straight is pretty dang close minded. Let's jump to the Emerald Forest arc of this volume, where our pairings on each team and the teams as a whole are brought together. For Weiss and Ruby, finding each other as partners is a complete accident. Ruby is vying to be on a team with her sister still living in Yang's shadow a little at this point in the show, and Weiss is desperate to be partnered with a high-class student like Pira. Neither get what they want, but it's exactly the person they need in the end. With Blake and Yang, it's a little bit more deliberate, at least on Blake's part. Blake seems to choose to partner with Yang. I don't believe that she went hunting through the Emerald Forest looking for her, but when she heard Yang nearby and saw her making some pretty easy work of some grim Ursa, Blake decides this is who she wants to partner with. Here's the director's commentary from this volume talking about this scene. The uh, black character that runs by is actually Blake. It is. Yeah, fun fact. She is checking out Yang and is like, is She's like, damn good? girl, you hot. This is a big deal for Blake's character and their relationship going forward. Blake trusts Yang, a human, whether she knows why or not. This from a girl who isn't trusting of others at all, and especially given her experiences with her previous partner and fighting companion. Hopping over to volume 2 and we have a lot more moments between the two, 
with the show generally being better for character development and moments out with combat and cool fight scenes. Yang particularly comes into her own this volume, revealing a lot more depth to her character, mainly through her scenes with Blake. This volume goes out of its way to show how well Blake and Yang work as partners, and how the two appear to understand each other better than any other pair in the show. The dance arc is a perfect example of this. Blake has been driven to the brink over her worry of what the White Fang is plotting, a good deal of this stemming from her guilt over her former alignment with the organisation, even when it became more extreme and violent. Ruby, Weiss and Sun are all unable to bring Blake back down to earth and take her off the self-destructive path she is on. Yang, however, is shown to be confident and self-assured in swaying Blake. She knows what makes Blake tick. Uh, what does Blake think of all this? She's still being all, you know, Blakey. Obviously, I still can't think of a way to change her mind. Guys, trust me, Blake will be at the dance tomorrow. Cue burning the candle. Blake and Yang have a heart to heart. Yang explains that she too has a mission that drives her, the search for her mother, and that said mission had put Ruby in danger in the past. She wants to help Blake in her mission too, but knows that Blake torturing herself will end in disastrous consequences. The information Yang shares here is highly personal, revealing deep-rooted abandonment issues and appears to be something she hasn't really spoken about openly before to anyone. This again highlights the level of trust between the two and, of course, ultimately, Yang's advice and offer of a dance is enough to sway Blake. And if you feel like coming out tomorrow, I'll save you a dance. Also, I really can't help but to point out setting with this particular scene. It's warm, intimate, and makes Yang look like some glowing goddess at points. It's the scene that truly sets up their dynamic going forward. Here's Monty talking about this particular scene. Aww. This is great. We need to use this again somewhere down the line in a more extreme fashion. For the rest of this volume, we see Yang and Blake being more open with each other and the team generally. I love it when you're feisty. When I leave the academy, what will I... How can I induce so many years of hate? I'm sure you'll figure it out. You're not one to back down from a challenge, Blake. Yang's advice in the end truly pays off for Blake, who chooses not to end Tortric's life, instead giving him a beautiful kick to the side of the head. She doesn't let her mission control her. <laughs> Why are we fighting? I saw you at the rally. We're on the same side, and you know it. So what's it gonna be, Blake? Basically, what Volume 2 shows us is that Blake and Yang make each other better as people. Though, in this volume, it's Yang who does most of the heavy lifting in terms of support and advice. Okay, still with me folks? We've got roads to go yet, but this volume is the biggie for Blake and Yang's relationship. This was where, for me and for a good deal of other people, the possibility of Bumblebee becoming canon in the future wasn't a completely ridiculous notion. The ending of volume 3 ties Blake and Yang's character arcs together irrevocably. You all know what scene I'm talking about here, and we'll get to that, but first it's important to examine the build up to that disarming moment. So, Yang, having just broken Mercury's leg in front of a worldwide audience, a Mercury who was on the ground and down for the count. Of course, that's not really what happened, but that's exactly what the rest of Team Ruby, and importantly, Blake, saw. Weiss and Ruby are pretty quick to defend Yang. They're not sure what actually went down, but they don't think Yang would be capable of being so ruthless. Blake, on the other hand, is shown to be incredibly unsure, horrified even. Yang is reminding her of Adam. lie to us. I had someone very dear to me change. It wasn't in an instant, it was gradual. Little choices that began to pile up. 
He told me not to worry. At first they were accidents, then it was self-defense. Before long, even I began to think he was right. This is all just very familiar. She voices this in the show, drawing direct parallels between the two. They are foils to each other. Adam, for all intents and purposes, was someone Blake was very close to in the past. Blake goes out of her way to equate the level of care and trust she has for Yang as what she once had for Adam, and doesn't want to see her fall down a dark path like he did. Yang is deeply upset that Blake doesn't believe her. In fact, this is the first time in the show's canon that we see Yang shed a tear. That's how much Blake and Blake's trust in her means to Yang. Of course, in the end, Blake is able to see that Yang is being sincere in her innocence, that she isn't like Adam Taurus, and she never will be. So, I want to trust you. I will trust you. But first, I need you to look me in the eyes and tell me that he attacked you. I need you to promise me that you regret having to do what you did. She asks Yang to look her in the eyes to judge whether she is being truthful or not. A nice touch when you consider the fact that Adam spent most of his time wearing a mask that hid his eyes, especially on missions. Okay, with the build up out of the way, let's look at the key moment during the fall of Beacon. Yang goes to find Blake, who has split from the rest of the team to chase down some members of the White Fang. She went after an Alpha. And some members of the White Fang. Yang, knowing Blake's history and weakness when it comes to the White Fang, is probably very aware that Blake is going to end up getting herself killed left to her own devices. Cue Adam, stabbing Blake in order to make her scream to draw Yang towards them. <coughs> he sees the look of horror on Blake's face, that this is someone Blake cares about deeply, perhaps as much as she once cared for him. Fun fact, although not so fun, this is the second time Yang cries in the show, again over Blake as she throws herself into the fray. Adam uses Moon Slice on Yang, and Blake jumps to defend her in desperation. Again, Adam is enraged that Blake is willing to defend someone other than himself, a human at that. He tries to decapitate her on the spot in spite. Why must you hurt me, Blake? Adam threatens to hurt everyone that Blake loves, and he's able to assess just from how Blake looks at Yang that Blake loves Yang, whether she even realises it herself. Blake, fearful of bringing more heart and pain to her teammates, and Yang particularly, runs away, hoping that distancing herself from the rest of them will keep them safe from her past. Yang is shown to be incredibly hurt by Blake leaving. After all, she revealed her issues with abandonment to Blake and Blake only. After we got to the city, she just ran. But why? I don't know. And I don't care. There has to be a reason she- No, there doesn't. Sometimes bad things just happen, Ruby. And as Yang makes clear later in Volume 5, she doesn't blame Blake for what happened to her. She wants both of them to be there for each other. Maybe you can still frame all of this as platonic rather than romantic, particularly on Blake's side. But if we stripped all of this back, everything from volume 1 to 3, and placed a male character in Yang's shoes, would we dismiss the romantic coding and connotations of these scenes so easily? I doubt it. Alright, so volume 4. Blake and Yang are separated now for the better part of two volumes, and they get the chance to grow and heal away from each other. Yang starts her recovery from her trauma, learns how to fight smarter from her father, and Blake reconnects with her parents. Sun helps her to understand that sometimes the gal has to let her friends be there for her, even when she doesn't want them to be. When your friends fight for you, it's because we want to. So stop pushing us out. That hurts more than anything the bad guys could ever do to us. Note that even in this volume, Blake's thoughts are shown to be on Yang. See this shot in the opening? And anytime she brings up what happened to Beacon, it's Yang's name who causes her the most heartbreak. Do you think I like being alone? Every day, 
Every day I think about them. Ruby, Weiss, Yang. They were my friends. I love them like I never thought I could love anybody. And I hope they hate me for leaving. Yang's really dealing with her own shit this volume. But it's pretty interesting that one of the first shots we see of Yang, she is looking mournfully at a pile of books. It's a small visual detail I know, but it seems very deliberate to me. Another rather minor, but no doubt deliberate choice, was to have Yang and Blake both ride on the same boat at different points in the volume. Said boat is named Pride. Miles and Kerry really being subtle with that one, but I see you. Couldn't have called the boat Boaty McBoatface? You had to call it something that invoked LGBT pride? Alright, here we go boys, volume 5, time to reunite those bees. This volume sees Yang and Blake confront a whole heap of past trauma and ultimately come out stronger for it. Narratively, Volume 5 was a bit of a mess. However, it allowed Yang to confront Raven, the woman who abandoned her multiple times, despite, you know, being her mother, and Blake, learning to forgive herself and forgive Elia, ultimately setting up a path to bring the fractured White Fang and the Faunus, those who want to work towards equality and peace at least, back from the brink. Yang's feelings for Blake become far more apparent this volume, especially during her heart to heart with Weiss. I mean, Look at her petting Blake's side of this picture longingly. Yang is clearly still deeply upset that Blake left under the circumstances she did, but ultimately her sadness seems to be coming from a place of frustration. Frustration that Blake had chose to run again, hadn't given Yang the chance to try and make her stay, to reassure her that what happened during the fall wasn't Blake's fault. She doesn't have to be alone though. I was here for her. We all were. She chose to leave us. No one blamed her for anything. If she had just talked to us, she would have known that. How could I be there for her if she doesn't let me? What if I needed her here for me? I'm not even sure Yang knows at this point how deeply her feelings run. She's so torn up by Blake's leaving still, and hasn't seen the girl in almost a year. It's a lot easier to be mad at someone that you don't have to look in the eye. The song All That Matters on the Volume 5 soundtrack gives us a pretty good insight into Yang's internalised emotions about Blake. it's clear that Yang would absolutely not feel so heartbroken about Ruby or Weiss leaving her in the manner that Blake did. The bond she has with the rest of her teammates is not the same as the one she has for Blake. The episode that features this emotionally charged talk between Yang and Weiss also happens to be in the episode in which Elia is revealed as Ruby's first LGBT character within the show's canon, which I really don't think was an accident on the writer's part. The stuff between Blake and Yang may have been narratively more subtle in volumes 4 and 5, the fact that the characters basically didn't see each other during that time helped with that, but the hints and clues are still there, if you know where to look. Of course, we can't gloss over their reunion. Blake stepping into a room full of people she knew and hadn't seen in a long ass time, scanning the room and singling out Yang, confirmed to me that Blake's thoughts whilst she was home had always been drifting across the ocean to Vale and to Patch. Yang? And just look at Yang's face. This is the face of a girl who really doesn't know what the hell to think. She's been mad at Blake for a while, extremely conflicted in how she feels, and now the girl is standing in front of her, looking like that, and she really doesn't know what to do or say or how to feel. This volume ends with Team Ruby sharing a group hug, and Yang appears to offer forgiveness but this was more than likely to appease Ruby and Weiss than because she trusted Blake to stick around again. I'm not going anywhere. That's all that matters. <laughs> that we're all here together. Right? 
You lost, you found your heart to pin down. Yeah. I never know if you'll come through. Then you appear together. This is where stuff with Blake and Yang gets a lot less subtle in build up and development. Massively helped by the fact that the two, you know, are in each other's company again after two volumes. Basically their character arcs in volume 6 is about rebuilding their trust and friendship. Blake goes absolutely out of her way to help Yang, defend her and just generally keep a watchful eye. She's very loud and hyper aware of Yang at all times. Yang tries to reassure Blake that things are okay between them, but Blake isn't convinced leading to their argument in the barn. Blake, who even from the earliest points in the show, is someone ridden with guilt over her past and her mistakes, wants to make it up to Yang desperately, vowing to stay by her side. Which goes down pretty well with Yang. That's all she really wants. Look how soft these eyes are. Unlike everyone else in the show, Blake treats Yang's arm like it's a natural part of her. Not a weapon or something to marvel at, it's Yang's arm, hand and fingers as far as she's concerned. But then Blake also vows to protect Yang against Adam. Not because she sees Yang as weak or incapable of defending herself, but because she failed to protect Yang from Adam in the past and wants to make sure she is there for her this time, to take Yang's pain. This particular vow is a big mistake on Blake's part and leads to Yang storming out. Yang wants an equal partnership, she doesn't want Blake dying for her or getting hurt for her. Whatever they face, she wants them to face it on equal terms, which at this point Blake doesn't get. Cue Blake and Yang riding to the relay tower to shut it down. The two of them at this moment in time seem to get along best when they have a mission to focus on. It likely reminds them of easier times back at Beacon before the shared trauma Adam inflicted on them at the end of volume 3. We see that in the train fight at the start of this volume and now. This whole exchange really speaks for itself. Blake and Yang have some playful banter, or that sort of giddy nervous around each other that makes you want to die a little, but also warms your heart. You sure I shouldn't come with? More intruders means we're more likely to be seen. Besides, stealth isn't exactly your... Um... I mean, you're great, and I'll hurry back. Go. Heading in on foot, won't be long. And just look at the way the two look at each other. This is so soft. Literally the only other characters we see look at each other like this in the show are Ren and Nora. They can't help themselves when things are going okay around them. But then of course things don't go so okay. Adam, who has long been an established foil to Yang, and the source of most of Blake and Yang's pain, enters the fray, intent to end Blake's life once and for all. Not that he won't toy with her before that. Yang, with what is easily the best entrance of the series, literally crashes into the scene to smack Adam with the humble bumble bike. You know how most of the fight goes, Adam is shown multiple times to be jealous of how close Blake and Yang are. He sees in them the same emotions he saw all over Blake's face during the fall of Beacon, and it makes him furious. Blake vows again, this time learning from her mistake at the barn. Their partnership is an equal one. Neither of them are weaker or more worthy of protection than the other. They are a unified force. She's not protecting me, Adam. And I'm not protecting her. We're protecting each other. This obviously strikes a chord with Yang. It's exactly what she wanted and needed to hear from Blake. Not only that, but Blake is stubborn. She won't die a noble death protecting Yang from Adam. She wants to fight this together, so that they can have some kind of life together afterwards. I don't have a choice. I have people who actually care about me. And I promised I'd never leave them again. So I'm not dying now. Yang also highly approves of this. Blake isn't going to leave her ever again. 
Also, Ruby makes a big thing out of romantic pairings holding hands. Just look at Arcos and Renora, and look how many times Blake and Yang have held hands this volume. I think this fight is where Yang really gets the measure of who Adam is as a person too. She probably had an idea from the way Blake spoke about him at Beacon, and how casually he went about stabbing Blake during Beacon's fall, but especially how he speaks to her and about her during this fight calling her a coward, insinuating her betrayal, his possessiveness, and his jealous nature around Blake. She puts the pieces together and finally understands why Blake left after the fall. This guy. The two of them defeat Adam together, with Blake breaking down afterwards, terrified that Yang might have taken Adam's words to heart, that Blake would break her promise. Yang knows now that Blake really is ride or die for her. Also, look at the way this whole scene is framed. It's intimate. Again, there's no background score, the emotions of the characters, the strength of feeling between the two, carries the weight of the scene. Anytime we've seen Yang hold someone else, it's never been like this. This is a deeply personal moment and romantically charged in how it's animated, made to be deliberately different from how she's held anyone else before. In the finale, we get a few great moments too. Yang reassuring Blake, this cute little handhold over Blake's thigh, which again is a level of intimate interaction Yang and Blake simply don't have with other characters. And of course, this knowing look between Ruby and Yang. Yang looks away with so much love in her eyes that she looks in danger of imploding from gay feelings in all honesty. I can relate too hard to that feeling. Now that we've reached the end of this section, yes this video is fucking long, sorry not sorry, let's look at another interesting creative choice with the writers. So with Renora, who are all but confirmed at this point, the narrative device that brought them together together properly was taking down the Nukalavi Grim, a source of shared trauma from their past, with the episode ending in a cute as hell handhold on an airship, looking at each other softly. Oh look, Bumblebee got the exact same treatment. I wonder if that's supposed to be a romantic parallel. Spoiler, it is. So I can't really do a video essay about Bumblebee without talking about Black Sun. Back at the beginning of Ruby, I do think that Black Sun was a viable romantic choice for Blake, but I really don't think that Black Sun was ever meant to be endgame. It's a cute pairing, and I absolutely adore Sun as characters go, and can understand why people enjoy the idea of him and Blake getting together. However, with what we're presented with in the show, I do think that Bumblebee has more potential narrative merit and emotional weight in upcoming volumes outside of what it could do for LGBT representation. I do honestly believe that Blake had a crush on Sun, likely during volumes 1-3, to three, but that her feelings never ran deeper than that, especially after the traumatic events at the end of volume 3. Sun, my poor monkey boy, definitely had deeper feelings for Blake, but post volume 3 he never tried to push those feelings onto her, instead understanding that Blake was in a vulnerable state of mind at that time, and what she really needed was a friend she could rely on. Blake and Sun, dynamic-wise, actually works best in Volume 5, when I felt the writers tried to make things a little more platonic between the two of them. Listen, just because the two spent Volumes 4 and 5 together doesn't mean that the two were meant to be together romantically. The fact that nothing explicitly romantic happened between the two in all of that time is telling that romantic Black Sun was not the plan. If it had been, Sun would have went after Blake and confronted Adam in the Volume 3 finale, not Yang. He was there with the rest of them, and easily could have been the one to go and find Blake instead, but he wasn't, and that's important since everything that happens afterwards ties Yang and Blake's narratives together regardless of the distance between them. In Volume 4, their relationship between Blake and Sun was pretty rocky, and hard to watch at times. Blake was really not happy that Sun had followed her for a long time without revealing himself, and Sun misunderstood Blake's intentions for leaving too believing she was on a mission of revenge against the White Fang. They are both shown multiple times in this volume to not totally understand each other. Whoa. Son! Jeez! Have you been following me? The moment you left, I knew exactly what you were doing. You're going on a one-woman rampage against the White Fang! What? I... <clears throat> Son! <clears throat> oh, whoa! 
This isn't the bathroom. Uh, I'll just be going. Sorry to interrupt this tender family moment. <laughs> Son doesn't understand Blake's need for privacy in space, and Blake reacts in aggression, something I really wasn't happy with, and sort of put me off the idea of them being together completely. Ugh. No concept of privacy, no respect for personal space. I'm sorry, okay? Ow, I'm sorry! Ugh. Look, I promise it was important. I needed to find you to talk to you. What, son? What could be so important? I was talking to your mom and she said something weird about the White Fang. I'm stopping you right there. But- I told you. I'm not here to fight the White Fang. I'm not here to fight anyone. I'm here to rest, to figure things out, and to see my family. That was uncomfortable to watch, and I think it was supposed to be a big red flag that they wouldn't work romantically. Sun has also been pretty interestingly framed in regards to Yang. In Volume 2, he didn't know how to convince Blake to come to the dance and get through to her. But Yang did. Yang was able to get through to Blake when no one else could. At the end of Volume 3, the framing of this scene, with Sun looking over Blake and Yang holding hands on the ground, I feel was also very important going forward. Sun knows what Yang did, sacrificed for Blake, that she cares just as much as he does. Sun is also the one to bring up Yang the most post Volume 3, understanding the importance of Blake's relationship with Yang to her well-being and recovery. After he is injured by Elia, Sun is quick to compare his level of commitment to Blake as to Yang's, knowing that Yang wouldn't want Blake to feel guilt for what happened to her, but rather would be upset that Blake hadn't let her in in the first place. No more. They're better off without me. I made my choices and I'll deal with the consequences because they belong to me. You think you're being selfless, but you're not. Yeah. That chameleon friend of yours got me pretty good. But I'd do it all again if I'm in protecting you. And I can promise Yang would say the same. You can make your own choices, sure. <sighs> but you don't get to make ours. He's also the one to make sure that Blake walks over to her teammates when she's hesitant. He knows where she belongs and what will make her truly happy. It's something he reiterates at the start of Volume 6. I had a lot of fun. But you're with who you're supposed to be now. It was never about that brainiac. Basically Sun is best boy, who just wants Blake to be happy and knows she's in safe hands with Yang. If you think Sun is going to be jealous if the next time he sees Blake and Yang they are together romantically, you're doing a big disservice to Sun's character. He's selfless. Honestly, all I want for Sun is for him to find a cute warrior gal with less emotional baggage and evil exes, and go and spread some positive vibes around Remnant. I go where I'm needed. Okay, so things are gonna get a little bit more toxic now. I want this video to be as comprehensive as possible, and that means talking about this shit too. Attacking and harassing members of the Ruby writing team and cast because you're not happy with the direction the show has gone in, one that has been foreshadowed from early volumes, is unacceptable. Just stop or leave. It doesn't reflect well on you and won't change anything. Tossing around Monty's name as though you had any insight into where he actually wanted the show to go, especially spitting poisonous rhetoric that Monty was stung by bees, that his friends are betraying his vision, it's just plain wrong. Maybe Bumblebee was planned before Volume 1 even aired. There's plenty in the show and out with to suggest it might have been. Maybe it wasn't. We'll find out eventually. But it really doesn't matter. I'm not going to pretend I speak for Monty. I don't. But here's the man himself talking about queer representation in Ruby. Asking if there will be any queer characters in Ruby. Sure, absolutely. Um, the best part about that is, you know, maybe they're there now because uh, they're kids. So we're on a path to try to help them discover themselves. So we don't even need to make that decision right away because as we write these characters, we learn about them and kind of help them figure themselves out. And they're very real to us. We're definitely not opposed to it. I'm, a lot of us are for it, even. Like, a, uh, I have some cast members and some crew members who are like, this would be really cool. But the thing is, we can't just shove it out there. It's just, it has to be earned, which is which is the better way to do it. And a lot of these characters, we try to look, look at them outside of their gender, so we just want to do what's natural for them at best. Good romance is earned. 
Want to know why they didn't make Bumblebee canon after Volume 2 and be done with it? Because it wasn't earned yet. Blake and Yang still had a lot of growing to do as people. I wouldn't even say Bumblebee is canon now. I'd say it's on a very clear path to becoming canon, likely at some point in Volume 7. Regardless, the development is there. The foreshadowing is there. It just needs a little bit more build up which I'm sure Volume 7 will deliver. None of this is out of the blue. You just have to be open and perceptive to the possibility, I suppose, to have noticed and seen the smaller moments. Some of us have the advantage of having been in same-sex relationships and can recognise things in the dynamic between Blake and Yang throughout all six volumes which blur the line between platonic and romantic. Just look at the difference in reaction between Renora and Arco's development and recent stuff with Bumblebee. Why all the hate? It's hypocritical when all of these pairings have had just as much on-screen development as each other. Renora and Bumblebee having more than Arcos in reality, because, well, that ship was slightly hindered. Heteronormativity exists. It's a plain old fact that I've been guilty of myself in the past. It's harder for queer parents to reach the height of canon for a multitude of reasons, like restrictions from the network that produces the show. I mean, just look at Marceline and Bubblegum from Adventure Time. The show for years and years would be going out of its way to imply that things between the two were far more than platonic, but Cartoon Network airing the show in countries much less accepting of LGBT people was always a blockade to explicit canonization until the show's last episode. Heterosexuality is the norm, the default. Interactions between male and female characters, especially with the level of intimacy and emotional weight that has been given to Blake and Yang's relationship, would no doubt be read as romantic because for the most part, that's what all of us have ever really known or expected from our entertainment. Heterosexual couples make up the vast majority of pairings on TV, and maybe that's a reflection of reality. Stats and queerness can vary pretty wildly from place to place and generation to generation. Thing is, Ruby is a fantasy program. It doesn't have to be a reflection of our world to still be relatable. It doesn't have to be constrained in its storytelling by real world stats. Besides, it's not like there would be a lack of balance between gay and straight pairings in the show even if Blake and Yang got together. The only other couple we have is Saffron and Terra, two side characters that will likely not show up again in the show for several volumes, if at all. If Blake and Yang's story helps 500 people come to terms with their sexuality, or at least gives them something to hold on to, which it has, and no doubt will continue to do in the future, then what is the real problem here? Starting petitions, calling for voice actors to lose their jobs, and generally being disrespectful to fans of the show and of the pairing is really not necessary and again just makes you look a little pathetic. Okay, we're nearly at the end. To finish this video off, I thought I would explain why I think Bumblebee will be beneficial to the narrative of the show and the storytelling going forward. Because I guess some people don't think Yang and Blake can be together unless they bring X, Y and Z to the show's plot. So for the team dynamic, a hot topic issue I've seen plenty of people speak about, that Bumblebee would ruin the dynamic of Team Ruby. I've got to disagree with you there. What dynamic within Team Ruby has always been the weak link? Easy answer there. Blake and Ruby. The two haven't really interacted since Volume 1, although they did have some nice exchanges and moments in Volume 6, which gives me hope going forward that the writers are very aware of this and plan to strengthen their bond. And what better way for some quality Blake and Ruby interaction than Blake going to Ruby for advice about Yang when she has doubts? The two of them laughing and joking about some embarrassing story from Yang's childhood, Ruby treating Blake like another sister, and being happy that Yang the person who has consistently put others before herself has someone else that loves her to watch out for her and makes her happy. Weiss? I'm sure I will have a lot on her plate with the Atlas plot, but wouldn't it be nice for her to inform and teach Blake and Yang about human faunus relationships in Atlas? I don't think Atlas society will be very accepting of such things and it will be a cool, although probably quite painful, narrative to explore with Yang experiencing and seeing the discrimination that Blake and other faunists have faced. We all want the writers to show us more discrimination and oppression for the faunists, so here's a good opportunity. There's also something poetic and narratively satisfying about Blake leading the way for the new White Fang, and embracing and working with humanity by being in a romantic relationship with a human. Just saying. 
And finally, just for the heck of it, I want to address the also talked about hand holding and running scene from the apathy arc. People have argued that this shows that Blake and Yang's dynamic will ruin the team and make them selfish. Number one, you don't just decide to ignore everyone else in your life when you have a significant other. And that's not what happens in this scene. Not when you examine the context. Yang has always believed in Ruby as a capable leader. She just saw her sister wipe out the apathy twice. Weiss is also very obviously in control at this moment in time. It's quite clear that both of them have the situation with Crow under control and will join the other soon. Thing is, Blake, who easily had the biggest fright of the whole group being inches away from having her guts blended by one of these gross claws, and being aware of it the whole time, is standing motionless after being helped upstairs. She's in shock, I believe. Mild shock, but shock nonetheless. I mean, can you imagine the look of sheer terror Ruby was giving her at this moment? Blake's shock and paralysis is a hindrance on Weiss and Ruby. And so, Yang, noticing this, grabs her hand to bring her back to goddamn reality and out of her haze, and runs outside with her, knowing that this is more helpful than leaving Blake standing and getting in the other's way, endangering the rest of the group. I don't doubt for a minute that had Ruby, Crow and Weiss had not exited a few seconds afterwards, that Yang wouldn't be back in there in a heartbeat to check they were okay. Ruby and Weiss are not incapable of handling themselves and Yang knows this. She's known it for a very long time. The truth till I just burn down the booth. Human torch can't fuck with me. Johnny Blaze, suspect B. Strike him quick, lightning fast. Melt them bitches down the ash. Well, congrats lads. You made it to the end. Whatever you take from this video, just don't be an asshole. Hopefully you enjoyed it. I would for sure like to make more of this content in the future. Thanks to all my lovely supporters on Patreon for helping to support the channel and to vote on this topic as my next video essay. Also, big props to Hammer Time for proofreading some of the script for me. I really appreciate it. Make sure to check out my lovely socials below. We've got a Twitter now, how goddamn advanced. And make sure to leave a comment giving your thoughts. See you on the flip side.